Hey, this is LOA Today, the Law of Attraction Show. Welcome to LOA Today. My name is Walt Thiessen. Today is Wednesday, January 23rd, 2013. With me today, Deborah Oakland. Over a six-year period, Deborah lost her 21-year-old son, her unborn baby girl in her eighth month of pregnancy, two brothers to the AIDS virus, and her father. If you are counting at home, that is five deaths in six years. Instead of giving up, she asked herself, what each one of those people would have wanted for her. And she concluded that they would have wanted her to live a life of courage, to encourage others, and to have a wonderful life. She created the website livingencourageonline.com, which she designed as a spiritual oasis where people can find encouragement to overcome life's biggest challenges. And she is here today to share with us some of the insights she has learned over the years that can help listeners who find themselves in similar circumstances to marshal the strength and courage to get back up there on their feet and live again. So, Deborah Oakland, welcome to the program. Thank you, Walt. Thank you for having me on the show. This is exciting, and it's great to meet you. It is exciting, isn't it? This is fun. It is. That's why I do this. It's so much fun doing this stuff. Well, that's what life's all about. It's supposed to be fun. It is supposed to be fun. Although, (laughs) a few years back, it wasn't so fun for you. What was it like? Tell us a little bit about that terrible six-year period that you went through. Well, it all began with the death of my brother, Tam, in 1992, And before that, it had been a long, long haul because both of my brothers had uh, the HIV virus, and uh, one had been previously married, so that's another story, but they both ended up with, with AIDS. And we were caretakers, and being anyone that's ever been a caretaker understands that it's, it's very challenging mentally, physically, and spiritually, as much as you love the person you're taking care of, it's hard on everyone. Mm-hmm. And all you want to do is serve them and and basically do your best to keep them happy, healthy, and on the best road as possible. And one thing that I find with people that are sick, it doesn't matter what is going on. It doesn't matter if it's cancer, AIDS, you know, arthritis, anything, dementia, they want to feel like everything is normal. Mm. They don't want to be treated like they're sick. And that's challenging, too, because you're trying to be a caretaker at the same time and make things things in life seem like, okay, everything's happy, everything's good for them. Sure. So it was a very, very long haul. My brother, Tim, uh, when they first announced AIDS on television, that the, this virus was out there, they were already testing on him at UCI. Oh. So he was one of the first, uh-huh. and he lived a long, long time. Hmm. I mean, a, a, a terribly, you know, long haul for him. Right. But he was very upbeat, so I think he he had this powerfully strong spirit, and I think that's what kept him alive, um, you know, a lot longer than most. My brother, Ted, he died within a year of finding out that he had AIDS. He had no will to fight. Uh-huh. Wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah, and he left very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, then, well, my my brother Tim died in 1992. Um, my husband Cody and I lost our baby girl in 1993, right before delivery. Ugh. And I was not aware that she had um, passed. She had already died. And I was carried her for another week, not knowing this. Mm. And I came home one day, and I and I, um, I just think my contractions were going crazy, and I wasn't quite due yet. So I called my doctor. Yeah, I was going to have um, the underwater birthing. Uh-huh. He said, "Well, you know, take this, and it'll stop the contractions, and then um, come come in." Well, I took the <clears throat> what he said, and it stopped the contractions, and then. I put some reggae music on my stomach. I, my husband and I, we thought, because she liked, she'd like to move around and dance to the music. Mm-hmm. And there was no movement. Mm-hmm. I knew something was wrong, so we went in and they found that she was stillborn. Yeah. I had to go through delivery. And then um, that was in 90. This all happened very quickly. 
and 93, and then in 94, my other brother had been sick for a year, <clears throat> and he passed away as well, and I, uh, <clears throat> it was, it was so hard on everyone in the family, everybody was still reeling from what had happened with Tam and, and with uh, Ren, our, our daughter, and then my brother's sick, and I talked to him through the last hour before he passed away. Hmm. Um, just just talked him through it, and um, he he had one tear come down, and he went. Mm-hmm. You know, our family had just stuck together through all of this. We grew stronger for it, right? And, and stuck together, and then um, in '95, my son, who was 21, was in Canada with his girlfriend, and they had just moved there. And um, it was a car accident. Mm. <clears throat> he, uh, it was it was a pretty tragic car accident because they skidded and went down through the ice, and the car flipped upside down. And you know, the woman that tried to save my son, she died trying to save him. And so it it was, and you know, that's the phone call you never expect to get. Right. You know, you, I wake up on a Sunday morning at five o'clock, and this call comes in, and. You just you're never prepared for this because you just don't think your children are going to go before you, and that was a very very long recovery and a and a long long healing process. And then my father came down; he got prostate cancer shortly after that, and uh, he passed away. I think it was in 2005. So, and then my mother's husband he had cancer and it ate away his whole face and that. And, and other friends and family members. So <clears throat> it was a very raw time, and yeah. it was like if if I ever heard, if I heard another person was gonna was gonna die or be sick, it was like sticking a, a knife in the wound and twisting it. I just you know you get to a point where you just can't take it anymore, and you just need to take care of yourself right. and rest. And my husband Cody is my my cheerleader, my greatest support system. Mm-hmm. And he just was amazing, and he also helped take care of all my, you know, all the family members, and worked with my brothers. And he's very good with with medical things, so he was really helpful in that department. Right. But uh, after that, became a healing period. And after each one of them had passed, I did. I asked myself, what would they want from me? Because you can fall apart, you can completely stop living and make it about yourself or poor me which is very easy to do oh yeah especially I need to, five know, deaths in six years good grief well you know i was raised in a in a wonderful family and very positive and uplifting and my mother was very metaphysical and so we were say we can't bring the back and with our the way we believe, if you have a belief system that works for you, and it pulls you through t- times like these, mm-hmm. it's a good one. And it worked for us. It worked for me all the way through. And I say if, if it doesn't work for you when you go through really difficult times, find one that does. This one worked for me. And I believe strongly that they're not gone, that we are not this body, that we are the soul and their soul moved on and for whatever reason they were here for that length of time was the, the reason they were here for mm-hmm. whatever lessons for whatever life experiences they were to share with the people they were with that is what was important for them and for us and i had to say okay i understand this and i bless them on their journey and I hold them in my heart and honor them with love and with living a good life myself and enjoying each day and learning how to move on in a place where I may be able to use the lessons that pulled me through to help other people. And that's why I started living in courage. Mm. Okay. Because there's none of us that don't go through loss of some sort. It doesn't whether it's a family member, a pet, uh, anything. It, loss is loss, and it affects you just as much. And I know the loss of a pet for many people is even 
more difficult because they can't speak to you. They can't tell you the pain they're in. Mm -hmm. They can't express to you or say goodbye in a way that humans can. And in and for people that don't have children and they have pets, or their pets are their life, it, it's, it's, there's no difference. That makes sense. makes total sense. Um, one of the things that I would think you would gain from an experience like you went through is, first of all, some self-knowledge that you can actually survive this stuff. You can, you can actually come through, which is probably not your first thought when it's happening. No. Survival. <laughs> yeah. Getting through the next moment. Um, I had never experienced shock before. I knew my brothers had AIDS, and, and it was a long process. And we, you know, you get to say goodbye. You get to say what you want to say. Mm-hmm. But with my son, it was immediate. Right. It was not expected. The interesting thing was, he, he his accident was actually January 21st, just a few days ago. Oh, my. It was the 21st, and in October, he brought his girlfriend to visit us in Laguna Beach. We had not met her. Mm -hmm. And they came out for a couple of weeks, and we had the most amazing visit. It was fantastic. And this was not like him. He called me, Mom, we're coming coming out, we're going to visit, and we're going to stay, and we had an amazing time. And before he left, he said, Mom, I want to meet you at Grandma's in Colorado for Christmas. This was not like him. I said, Hmm. Okay. He said, I just want it. I'm not inviting my girlfriend. I'm, I, I just want it to be us, the family, just us. And I said, okay. So we arranged everything for Christmas with my mother, and we went out, and we talked for like six days nonstop about spiritual matters. What, he, he wanted to know everything. What happens when you, what do you think happens when you die? Um, what do you believe? What do you, what do you think? What about God? What about spirituality? Do you believe there's life after death? He wanted to know everything and, and, and why I left his father and all the details. We said everything we could have ever wanted to say to each other in those days. Everything. There was nothing un- left uncovered. And Christmas Day, he walked into the kitchen and my, my mother was in the kitchen. We were already in the other room. And he said, Grandma, I'm not supposed to be here. Wow. I said, what? We love having you here for Christmas. What are you talking about? Come on in the other room. He said, no, I'm not supposed to be here on this earth. And she said, oh, oh, oh. You know, she kind of just didn't take it to heart at the moment. Sure. Because we'd been doing a lot of talking about all of these things. So we went in the living room, and and um, after the accident, she she called me and told me what he said. Yeah, it's like he knew he prepaved all of this, mm. and it was very it was very uh, healing to me because I had closure. If 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 I hadn't had that time with him and met his girlfriend, who we are still very close with, and couldn't have gotten through this without coming to stay with us after the accident. Mm. Um, we just talked to her on Facebook the other night. I mean, she's still, it, it just tears her up every mm-hmm. year at this time. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's now married with two children and happy. And But it's, it's, very, it's very difficult for, for anyone that goes through this type, this type of loss. Mm. And uh, he prepaved this. And then when we took him to the airport from my mother's, the plane was late. So we walked in, and we sat down on a bench together when my husband, um, I was, Wade was on my left, and, and uh, I was sitting next to him, and we had about an hour, and he gave me a piece of gum, and we held hands, and uh, we didn't talk. Hmm. That was the last time I saw him. Wow. Yeah, there definitely seems like, there was something going on there that he sensed or something along that line. It's like he knew. He took care of everything. He took his girlfriend after they left Laguna Beach. They went to travel and visit family and friends, and he saw everyone. It's like he closed all these doors very mm. peacefully. And yeah. maybe, you know, someone had told me previously, that, you know, I had somebody that was psychic-ish, and I don't always listened to that, but she said he would have left when he was 14, but because of all the loss around my life, he knew I couldn't, 
I couldn't handle it. So he waited. Hmm. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Yeah. But I'm very grateful for the time that I had with him those 21 years. He was amazing. We were just so synchronized together. We were like, I mean, we never fought. We just got along so well. And uh, it was just an amazing experience. And I'm so grateful to have had the time with each one of them. Mm. For however long I had them, they were incredible. And, and, and I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for each of them and for each experience. That, uh, you know, I, I don't, when I move into the future, I don't like to drag old um, baggage behind me, with me, into mm-hmm. the present, into, mm-hmm. the, into the future. But I take those experiences and learn from them and live in gratitude for them because they shape who you are. And you can either take those experiences and let them destroy you or you can take those experiences, learn from them, grow from them, and become stronger, more courageous, and more alive. Absolutely. Um, what, a couple of thoughts go through my mind as you're describing all that, and so I just want to run them by, the, by you and see what you think. Um, about a week ago, a week ago Tuesday, actually, uh, we interviewed Bill Guggenheim, the author of Hello from Heaven, who writes about after-death communications. And mm. so my first thought was, have you had any after-death communications with any of these five people? No, I haven't, but I've had the feeling. I felt it. I haven't had much actual verbal where I've I've. I've, I've seen, not where I've seen with my eyes, mm-hmm. or, I, I mean, I'm more audio. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I have information come in through me and hear it, and I have that way and in dream states, mm-hmm. but not physically seen anything, no. I was uh, reading Robert Schwartz's book about um, uh, the, the life we plan before we come here and, and, and all the scenarios that he has in his books, and... Uh, it's interesting because everyone has a different experience. Some people physically see them. Right. I I did not. I feel them. Mm-hmm. I can feel their energy. My mother has had many experiences, particularly with my brother Tim. Hmm. She'll be driving in her car. He smoked, uh, I think it was camel cigarettes, something horrible, <laughs> some cam- camel cigarettes. He, and, and she could not stand it. And they had their fights you know he was a piece of work man he was a he was a tough one <laughs> mm. and uh he he my my family we had uh three adopted in my family and uh two sisters and a brother and tim was adopted and he just came in just oh mom said you know you're adopted we got to pick you out we you know you're the chosen one we got to choose you he goes well i didn't get <laughs> he was just all over the place you know mm. he, he was he was a um, very strong character he was amazing and uh, she, she said that when she would drive her car her car's closed up she's never smoked in her life doesn't smoke she would smell those camel cigarettes if she'd get upset about something hmm. or or start to cry about him she'd smell those cigarettes like they were they, they like there was smoke in the car or when she'd be marking, walking through a supermarket or at home, and she knew it was him. So she's had some different experiences. But yeah. uh, you, know, you, you just know, you can feel when they're around. The other thought that came to my mind as you were describing each of their stories and, and how they impacted you and, and how you impacted them as well, apparently, is that it's, it's one of those things when you have five and, and six years You've got to be thinking to yourself, is there something going on here? Is there some mm-hmm. kind of, I don't know, it, it's almost like you're living under a cloud or something to have all those things happen. Right. Did that thought ever occur to you? Did that ever? Did, did you ever wonder, like, you know, how, how could this possibly happen in such a short period of time? Well, you wonder, why me? Mm. What about, what, what is this about, you know, uh well, I have, I'm going to go back to the day that I found out about my son. Okay. My, my husband got up at 5 in the morning, went out and answered the phone. I thought it was his brother because his brother's a diabetic and there had been problems. So I, he was gone a while, so I just went back to sleep. He comes back in and he doesn't warn me. He sits down and he's in shock. And he said, Wade's dead. My, I'm half asleep. Mm. 
my first thought is go back out of the door and 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 this didn't happen just go back yeah. out in the living room and then you, you, you can't comprehend it i mean i i couldn't even it didn't even register because he'd been on on the phone with with wade's girlfriend for a long time she, because of the situation that happened which is another story in itself which is incredible i don't have time to tell you it's an amazing story in itself but I was in shock and like I said before I've never been in shock and when you're in shock you you want to sit down and be still but the minute you do you got you, you get up and move you, you don't want to be still you don't know what to do mm-hmm. you don't want to be still you don't you don't I didn't know what to do I've never been in this kind of shock before we had a, a scheduled event that morning a spiritual scheduled event to go to now, my son was in Canada. There was nothing I could do. I couldn't go out there. There was nothing I could do that day. So I called my two friends, we, my husband, to cancel this spiritual event that we were going to. And uh, my friends came to the door. They came over. They were neighbors. And they said, we don't mean to interfere, and we know we understand what you're going through. And they had both had loss, too. Mm. But... You may think about going to this event. It may help you. What are you going to do anyway? Lay here in bed. There's nothing you can do. And we talked about it, and I don't know. I was in so much shock. I was just like, whatever. Uh, yeah. you know. So we went. It was a cry-on event with Lee Carroll. I don't know if you're familiar with him. No, but tell us. Well, he, he channels um, cry-on, and... Anyway, he has these huge events, and he has a new book out now about the 12 levels of um, uh, 12 levels of uh, DNA in our consciousness and what's happening to our bodies right now. It's a pretty amazing book. So I didn't know much about any of this, about Cryon. So we go to the event, and we were the first ones there, and I'm just sitting there on, on the side, and this woman comes up to me and to unlock the door for this event. It was a lot of people going, mm-hmm. you know. 400 people, 300 people, and she said, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not. My son just was in a car accident this morning. She said, you're white as a ghost. She goes, come in, come in. So she took me in, and when Lee got there, uh, she said, this woman has just lost her son, and he said, I'm so sorry, and he talked to me, and he, um, you know, he said, I, my condolences, and so anyway, we all went in and sat it, sat down. We were in the fourth row. I sat directly behind Louise Hay. Oh, my. And the, the interesting thing is, when he got on stage, he says, I'm, my wife and I were driving, or my, my partner and I were driving here to the event. And she said to me, what are you going to be speaking on today? He said, I don't know. She said, well, you always are given, you know, what you're going to be speaking on. You know what you're going to be doing. And he said, I, I, don't, I don't know. I've been given no information. I don't know. And he said, when I arrived here, I met a woman who lost her son. And he said, we will be talking about the loss of children. And this is a full-day event. And he said, this event includes four people in this audience who have recently lost children. Mm. And the whole event was around the loss of children. And if I hadn't gone to that event, I wouldn't have had that beginning of that healing that I had there. I met some other people there who became friends, and you know, I, I sat directly behind Louise Hay, and um, he didn't point us out, the people that had lost children, but it's like she knew, you know, and, and it's like certain people knew, hmm. and it just it just was an amazing experience. Hmm. So. Everything around all of this. I mean, I had taken my husband to dinner, I think, the, the night before my son's accident or two nights before. And I had take, I like to read to him sometimes when we, when we go to little restaurants by ourselves. It's all cozy and nice. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, and sometimes I'll read something to him. And <clears throat> I had taken a spiritual book about what happens after you die. And I'd read the whole chapter to him. So it was... All these incredible experiences around all of this. Mm. That's that's a remarkable sequence of events. It is. It is. And I just 
have to say to answer your question that I I just had to know that this was in my life for a reason. Mm. And maybe it all culminated to Living in Courage and the book I'm writing and how that's all going to tie into being able to assist other people, which I've done over the years. You You're writing know. a book. Yes, I'm writing a book. It's uh, <clears throat> I'm not I'm not giving up the name yet. Okay. <laughs> Shoot, we don't under, get a scoop today. <laughs> under wraps just for a little longer, because the theme that I've wrapped these uh, seven concepts around is really fun and something everyone loves. And so I'm very excited. This book has morphed and changed over the last three years. I thought it was going to be out sooner than it is. This book has its own timing, its own life, and it is my greatest teacher. I'm allowing it to lead me forward as I take action on it, but it's, it's like this book is for everyone. Um, it's a gift from what I've learned throughout my life combined with these ancient spiritual principles to help other people that need assistance in life, that need to be encouraged and need more joy, um, just a lot of it is about the laws of love. And and to me, the law of love is the creative force behind every manifestation in the universe. And I know you are all about the law of attraction. And I also firmly believe that we are energy, as is everything in this universe, and that we vibrate at different frequencies mm -hmm. to other people. And I, and I write about it in my book. If, it may be, maybe if you have some people in your life that you really love, but things don't vibrate the same anymore. You're not on the same frequency anymore, and they drop away. A lot of people feel a lot of loss and, and sadness around that. But you have to realize, perhaps they're not on your frequency anymore. Mm. Perhaps you just don't vibrate anymore at the same rate, and now you will vibrate and, and be on the frequency of someone else that's coming into your life where you can learn new things, obtain new lessons, and move on to different experiences in life. And they will as well, just with other people, people that are on their frequency it's a heck of a way to have to learn but it looks to me and sounds to me like you took a, a miserable six-year period and turned it into some wonderful knowledge i mean you have just <laughs> seriously well you know what am i going to do i i i it, poor me lay in bed be miserable lots it, of people choose that well they do but that's a choice and everything in life is a choice and we learn from the power of contrast. We have free will. I used my free will to say, no, they would want me to have a fabulous, happy life. I know that. And once they're, once they're wherever they are, they are without that body, and they probably really don't understand us being miserable about them being gone mm. because they're feeling just fine, and they're like, we don't want this for you. We want you to be happy. We want you to live in joy. Dance around. Celebrate our life. You know, don't take it and, and make yourself miserable. Because, you know, it, it becomes about you after a certain period of time. When, you're, when you carry that forward into your life in misery for enough time, it's about you. It's not about them anymore. Mm, that's a good point. That's a really important one, isn't it? And, and it's hard. It's, people don't want to hear it, and it's hard to say to people, but... Sometimes you just have to wake up and say, you know what, this is about me. This is no longer about them. This is about my life. What do I need to look at? What questions do I need to ask myself? Here's, here's, I was just looking at something on Facebook uh, a couple days ago. It's called, it's an ancient Sanskrit on the rules for being human. Hmm. And I love this. It says, you will receive a body. You will learn lessons. There are no mistakes, only lessons. A lesson is repeated until it is learned. Learning lessons does not end. There is no better than here, or there is no better than here. Others are merely mirrors of you. What you make of your life is up to you, and the answers lie inside of you. I love that. Mm. What what the particular resonates with you about that? Well, it's, it's I love condensed wisdom. That's why I love quotes. I've oh, okay. Any of my own. I've got 60, over 60 on my website. I love condensed wisdom. 
and this, the rules for being human, it just condenses it all into a short period or a short, a short little place where you can say, wow, yes, lessons will be re- repeated until they're learned. And we are mirrors for each other. There is, you know, there isn't better than here. You know, stay in the present moment. When you're in the present moment, you can connect to your higher source, higher self, God self, whatever, you, whatever name you want to give it, Bob, it doesn't matter. You know, whatever you resonate with as your higher self, that is where you can connect. When you stay in the present moment, you can hear, you can feel, you can live that wisdom. It becomes alive in you. Let, let me interrupt for a moment because I know this is a concept that was has long been a difficult one for me. What exactly do you mean by a higher self? A higher self. Well, I uh, let's see. How would how would I put this? It is the I like to think of of our higher self is our perfected self, our self that is the great intelligence of the universe. The great intelligence of that is in our DNA and every cell of our body mm-hmm. that is our individualized God self. And that we are a aspect of that higher self living here in human form. But that aspect of us, that higher aspect of us, never leaves us, is always with us, and is always inside of us. In, in our DNA, in the cells of our body. Some people show it as a threefold activity above the body and around the body. I mean, everyone has a different concept of it and a different belief system about it. Um, I just believe that we all have this power inside of us. And I always say, find a teacher, a, someone that leads you back in because your answers are inside of you. Live from the inside out, not the outside in. It's not out there. It's in you. Hmm. And for each person, that perfected self that knows everything is connected to universal intelligence that is the most perfect, beautiful, brilliant part of you is in you. You are that. You are that. Okay. You are that being, but you're an individualized aspect of it that, that is living here with free will. That aspect of yourself doesn't understand discord, doesn't connect to your duality. It is an individualized aspect of divine love and light that does not connect to any of the discord that we live in. That's what I would, that's the long version. That's very good. You did a nice job of that, especially put on the spot at the last second without warning. That's very good. (laughs) Oh, no, no problem. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going back about all this in my book. <laughs> well, okay, that well, that maybe does give you some practice then. But um, uh, I, I keep going back to those six years because uh, I'm sure there are listeners who've had, perhaps even very recently, similar experiences. Maybe yeah. some listeners who are going through what you went through right now. Yeah. And I know from personal experience, not so much from loss, but just in general from the you know the trials and tribulations that life throws at you, it can be tricky. It can be challenging to try to find joy and happiness in the midst of sorrow and depression and anger and and all that kind of stuff. What okay. what's your trick? How do you turn that around when you're when you're facing that that abyss and you're you're trying to figure out how can I turn my life around? What what tricks do you use? Well, I, I it's very important to go through the process. You okay. have to feel the grief and the, you need to go through the process. Find people that are very supportive and loving and understanding. Uh, find people that, that, that encourage you. That are able to give you a sense of it's okay to go through this. You need to go through this. There are there are steps to grief. There are. I'm not yeah. a grief counselor. I'm not a grief counselor. I'm not a coach. I'm I'm just me. You know, I, I don't. There are people that specialize in that. And if you need one of those people, find one. Mm. Find someone that has has a great deal of experience in dealing with this. I think you have to take a day at a time, a moment at a time, and that's why when you can stay in the present moment. 
that doesn't exist. It's done. When you're, when you're in the present moment, how do you feel? Usually pretty good. You know, nothing's hurting. You're, you're, you know, you're going about your day in the present moment. You're, you're having your morning coffee or you're getting up, you're being with your family. I mean, you, your life's pretty good. What right. takes it's you back is yeah. your thoughts. Your thoughts mm-hmm. create everything. Everything begins with thought. So only your thought can take you there. Right. And it yeah. isn't happening anymore. It's over. It's done. And that's the distinction, realizing that when you are feeling bad, the, the likelihood is close to 100% that you're thinking about the past. You're in the past. You're living in the past. And, and living in the past doesn't serve us. No. At all. In fact, it can't even be done when you really think about it. No. No. And, and dragging that baggage forward with you is like putting a chain behind you with this big ball and chain, and you're trying to drag yourself forward. Cut loose the chain. <laughs> Bless them wherever they are or whatever you're going through or uh, whatever abuse you've experienced in your past. It can only affect you when you bring it forward into your thought because it doesn't exist anymore. It's done. It's over. If you decide to live from that place daily, of course it's, it's, it's alive in your mind, in your heart. And forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the most critical things on this planet. Forgiveness and gratitude, two mm-hmm. of the most powerful things that you can connect to. You know, I mean, I with the with the events around my son's accident, there was a driver in the car. It was it's too long to explain, but I mean, I you have to forgive people. And and I remember Oprah saying that a woman that came on her show, she received more hate mail because this woman who had had caused the death through alcohol of of this woman's daughter had caused her death. This woman. Uh, that had was the mother of the daughter forgave her, her and they became friends. Mm. They came on the show together to talk about the power of forgiveness, mm. and Oprah never received so much hate mail. Wow! Because people are un- unable to understand forgiveness and to move on and, and to realize that it's all about love. Everything comes down to love and 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 living from your heart and forgiveness. And being grateful for what you have now, right now, for everything that's here and all that's yet to come, and not being worried about what was. You can't create a beautiful, beautiful present moment and a beautiful future when you're living in the misery of the past. You know, it's striking to think about those people that you mentioned who wrote into Oprah with all that hate mail. Oh. Every single one of them, based on what we're saying, <clears throat> excuse me, based on what we're saying here, must have been living in their own past too. Because we just said, any time that you're feeling pain, you're living in the past. You're not living in the present. So every one of them had to be responding to what was going on in their past. Yes, and that's really difficult for people to get past. You know what happened to them? Who to blame? Who can we blame? Right. You know, the blame game's over. Quit blaming people. You create everything in your life. You do. Nobody else does. There's nobody to blame. There's nobody to chase after. If you created it, you created it for your lessons, for whatever reason you needed it in your life. Look at it and say, why did I create this? Why did I bring this into my life? This is really uh, an important set of, of distinctions that we're addressing here because, among other things, what it tells me in our conversation is that not only is the feeling of ongoing pain an indicator that, up, oh, I'm thinking in the past again, but it's also a reminder that there really is tremendous power in focusing on living in the present because it helps you break the cycle of pain. It does. It really does. I mean, the present moment heals everything, especially when you can live it in joy. And, um, and that, that's really the most important part of all from my perspective, that the idea you can actually go, maybe not instantaneously, but you can no. actually go from the depths of depression to joy. It really is within reach. 
it is within reach and it is a choice. You know, when I think of my son, Wade, I just smile anytime I think of him. Because really? Oh, oh, anytime I hear his name, anything. You know, I know a lot of people when they talk about these issues, they cry, they can't talk. I don't do that because I don't feel sad for them. They're, I'm happy. Wherever they are, they're perfectly perfect. I mm. know that. And I smile whenever I think of him. He, he's just, he, it just makes me happy to think of him, any of them. I mean, I just mm-hmm. think about the good things, the, the happy things that happened, the great things that they brought into our lives, and we tell stories about them all the time, and we laugh, and, oh, it's just, they were a joy, each one of them. And plus, where they are is actually a good place. Yes. That's, that's the other thing that we tend to forget about. I, I was fortunate when my father passed in that my, my father passed in his late 80s uh, from mm-hmm. symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. Oh. And the last few months of his life particularly were just absolutely miserable. So in his case, when, when he passed, we were grateful. That was like, thank goodness. I had done all my grieving before that. His death was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. And sometimes, you know, it's it's like it's enough. Yeah. It's good. They need, it's, you know... Some people feel really guilty about saying, feeling okay that they left and, and that they're out of, of caretaking. They're out of, of watching that person go through pain, you know. And, and the reason I even mentioned my father, in addition to what, we're, what you're saying right there, is within four or five days after he passed, my sister had, uh, I guess you might call it a psychic after-death communication with him. And in, in, it was a sort of a short conversational auditory kind of thing. Um, and, and in the course of that, she had the presence of mind to say, what's it like on that side? Oh, what did he say? It came back with a one-word answer, and the one-word answer told me it was my father and not my sister making it up because it was a word she would never use. Uh-huh. The word was festive. Oh, how fun. <laughs> Isn't that fabulous? That's what I call a dad word. <laughs> oh, I love that. Because nobody uses the word festive anymore. <laughs> no. Oh, that's see, and it's those little things that. And it's so descriptive too. I mean, everybody, nobody uses the word, but everybody knows what festive means. Right. But... So you can just imagine it. it. There you have the other side where there's this. It, it, it's not anybody having bodies or anything like that. Right. It's all these spiritual beings all in the same place having this party. <laughs> I know, and you know, I think about them just being happy, and and the things I've read and from near death, you know, people just say it's there's such joy, such light, such happiness. They don't understand our pain. They're like, I'm fine. Why are you being? Why are you crying? I'm fine. I'm happy. Mm-hmm. It's a party. Mm-hmm. We're good. <laughs> yeah. And it's very difficult to hear all of that when you're going through, especially something that's fresh and raw. Uh, and you you just feel so wounded, but there is time heals. Time does heal. Take a day at a time. Mm. You know, live that day at a time the best you can, and just think about what they would want for you. They would want you to be happy. They really would. If they loved you like you love them, they would want you to be happy. It's that simple. Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, talking to Bill Guggenheim last week, the author of um, Hello from Heaven, he says that one of the most consistent uh, themes that comes through in these after-death communications over and over and over again, regardless of what the relationship was, whether it was a good relationship, a bad relationship, a trying relationship, whatever, it's always the same one. I want the best for you. It's always the same thing. That's quite remarkable. You know, I read something recently, a quote that I just, oh, my God. Gosh, the purpose of this life is not to have glossed over the table of contents, but <laughs> to have experienced in depth some of the most poignant and excruciating passages. Wow, that's very good. Mm. That's very, very good. I just, because pain keeps us separate from our joy and who we really are, and, and pain causes so much grief. And if you if you you know you need to go through that sadness and that that grief i understand that it's important because if you shove it and you don't feel anything you're going to have to deal with it later because when things come up that don't feel good for you 
you know, when you're on this spiritual path and, and you want to just feel really, really good and you're feeling great for a few days and everything's wonderful, and then all of a sudden something comes up and makes you feel just, it's like, what is that feeling? It's fear or it's unhappiness or it's whatever that feeling is that comes up. Mm-hmm. It's awful. You go, oh, I see you. You're coming up to be healed. Let's take a look at you. Okay, you don't serve me any longer. Thank you for, for showing yourself. I see you. I look at you. Uh, I thank you for your use in my life, but I let you go now. I release you, and I let you go. You no longer serve me. You know, you're reminding us that grief is something to go through. It is not something to reside within permanently. Exactly. And that's an excellent life lesson for anybody, no matter whether they're going through something difficult or not. Exactly. Now, joy is a place you do want to reside in permanently. Oh, that's what I aim for all the time. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's like my goal every day. I want how much joy can I feel today? <laughs> exactly. Well, that's what it's all about. And the more you feel that, it makes less room for discord and for unhappiness. Because sure you're does. pushing it out. You're yeah. making more room for joy. It's like cleaning your closet. Every time you clean your closet out and you, you get rid of all the stuff you don't need, oh, my gosh, look, all the new stuff comes in. Same thing. You know, you just push you, you just push out all the bad stuff and joy just keeps filling in. And love and happiness and synchronicity and the right people show up at the right time. And life just unfolds beautifully as it's supposed to. And it mm-hmm. does that when you can stay in the moment connected to joy which i think is basically just who we are anyway love love you know sure. the creative force in the universe I and mean, that could just be your higher self just love creative force yeah. we are here creator beings here to create and you notice when people are not creating and when you're depressed and you're going through horrible things you don't feel creative but when you can get back to that state and when we are creating that's when we are happiest When we're using our imagination, when we're creating, when we're illuminating our mind and we're just filled with possibility, that's when we're happy. I often think that when we're stuck in that cycle of depression and and as you were describing it, we're we're not really in the creation mode. I I think in a sense that we are in in a creation mode. We're in a negative creation mode and we don't realize that we're creating more and more depression for ourselves. That's the, 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 the trap that it takes us a long time sometimes to realize, wait a minute. I'm the one who's doing this. And whatever you're feeding into your soul, whatever you're feeding yourself is what you will become. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So livingencourageonline.com, what's the story there? How did that start? How did it evolve? And, and what's the response been? Well, after, after all of this happened, you know, I've been wanting to write my whole life, and I've been writing and sticking it under my bed my whole life and never really doing anything with it, and I mm-hmm. thought, and I'm an avid reader, I love paper, pens, everything, I just, it finally dawned on me after trying many different things in life that, oh my gosh, I want to write, I'm going to write. Cool. There's nobody to stop me, I'm going to write. So I I had my um, webmaster build me a website, which I need to redo now, it's been a while, but once the book comes out, I'll have a, a brand new, fresh website. Uh, and I started writing. I just started writing posts for these six years. I just started writing little posts. And uh, then I went on Facebook and Twitter and Pen- you know Pinterest. And I'm under Deborah Oakland. They're all under all of them. And Google Plus and uh, you know everywhere. I just started social networking and working with people. And I have a fan page on Facebook for Living in Courage. Uh, I also have a, a monthly newsletter that comes out in a free ebook called Living in Courage. If you go to my website, Living in Courage Online, um, and sign up for the newsletter, you get uh, my free ebook. It's a short one. Um, it's basically uh, just, well, just get it. <laughs> <You'll see laughs> it. I'll leave it as a surprise. <laughs> but uh, it's, li- it's called Living in Courage, and, um, and my book it is coming out is not about courage it's it's not specifically about my life it's it's different one day i may write a book about my life which would be really fascinating but not now okay 
So just uh, you can go there and get the ebook and sign up for my monthly newsletter, Living oh. in Courage. And what I do in that newsletter is I take one of the 144 qualities of love each month and I center the newsletter around that. And my fabulous friend, Steve Tallamy, writes about Mother Nature so beautifully. He's a contributing author in my book as well around these mm-hmm. concepts, writing about Mother Nature and how she supports these principles in her great wisdom. And he also writes an article each month in my newsletter. So we just pick something each month. And this month, I will give you a heads up because we haven't written it. For the month of February, will be the subject will be joy. Ah, uh-huh. Yes. That's enough by itself right there for me to subscribe, just because I'm into joy. Yes, so we're going to write about joy. All right. I feature different people's. I, I would love to feature your uh, your show on, uh, I should just feature you for, for February, feature your radio show. Well, we, we'd be very pleased and, and touched that you'd be interested in doing that. That would be awesome. Yeah. So uh, we just... All, all kinds of fabulous people, and and you know you know the fabulous Elizabeth Hamilton Garino and Deb Scott and the Best Ever You Show, and you know featured so many great people on the show. I just I, I love social networking. I've met so many people through it. You, you being one of them. Your timing was uh, absolutely fabulous. I mean, if you start all this six years ago with the blogging, you started at the exact moment that social media started to emerge and take off. I mean, perfect. Perfect timing. Oh, I did. <laughs> How funny! You know, I, I, I my friend just wrote a, a, a book um, about divorce uh, through wine. It's meritorious divorce through wine-colored glasses, because she owned a vineyard, and it, it's it's all done in wine metaphors, and I and I love it. And and I wrote the the back cover for her book, and she said, you know, I didn't do any of the social networking before I wrote my book, and she goes, now I'm I'm trying to figure it all out and she says every class I go to tells me everything you did you did perfectly exactly the way you're supposed to do it before you wrote the book and I didn't even know I was doing it Mm. I had no idea yeah well you were uh you were following your nose so to speak you you were following your intuitions and deciding based on this felt like the right direction to go and Mm -hmm. sure enough it was well when I stay in the moment that's what happens for me so I just learn to follow that and the nice thing is that even for those of us and I I would put myself in this category who throughout the years did not follow the intuitions who avoided the intuitions and ended up taking a long roundabout route you still get there it's okay (laughs) you're still going to get there there's no it's not a race there's no hurry we're all going to get there eventually how many people have said it's the journey not the destination well it is it's all about the journey I mean even yeah go ahead it's it's just Oh, and that's just too long to go into because it really okay. is about the journey, as you said. Well, I wanted to ask you, if I didn't mishear this because you kind of skipped over this part quick, did, did I understand you correctly to say you've counted 144 different uh, forms of love? No, it's not mine. It's it's a, it's a uh, it's something that was, was on the Internet. It, I don't know who put it on. It's called... It's the 144 qualities of love. Qualities, okay. And they go from A through through the W's, you know, just ever, gratitude, happiness, comp, you know, compassion, consciousness, dignity, diligence, limitlessness, motivation, non-judgment, receptivity, purpose, you know, transformation, vision, anything, worthiness, beautiful qualities of love, and you can get a copy of it uh, on my newsletter there is a oh, okay. to, to get a copy of it on my newsletter of the list very good very good I, I have to admit i didn't realize anybody had counted them that's really encouraging <laughs> <laughs> well it's all about love and i'm sure there's a lot that could be added to the list you know, well we count everything else up i mean everything is quantified in this life mm-hmm. you know, what, what took us so long to quantify love <laughs> exactly i mean there isn't anything that makes you feel like that. I mean, look at someone when they fall in love uh, for the first time, deeply mm-hmm. in love. The world falls away. Nothing else matters. I mean, you're, everybody looks happy. The sky looks brighter. The world looks more colorful. Love changes everything. So mm. if we can connect to that 
on a daily basis without having to fall in love every day, you know. With, which we can. Which we can. Fall in love with something else. Fall in love with a leaf on a tree. Fall in love with the sand on the beach, with the, the moon, the sun, the stars, everything. We're all connected. Right. Talk to everything. Talk to the plants. They love it when you touch them. They love human communication. Just it's amazing how everything. responsive plants are. Just amazing. Oh, they love it when you talk to them. I'm looking out my office window right now, and it's just full of trees and our garden outside, and you know, just mountains behind with all the trees up there. They love it when you look at them, and I love to look, watch their aura, their that beautiful violet aura around them. It's so gorgeous, blue violet. Yeah. It's funny you should mention the trees and so forth because I'm looking outside my window and seeing trees as well. And today is actually the coldest day we've had during this winter. It got down to single digits, which in northern Virginia where we live is, is pretty cold. It's not like you know New England or Minnesota or whatever, but uh, for this area it's cold. And yet I'm looking outside, and, and it's a little bit warmer now. It's probably, I don't know, temperatures in the 20s or low 30s or something like that. But just through our, our conversation here, it looks really nice out there. I mean, it could easily be in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> it's all perspective. It certainly is. It's it all certainly about perspective. Is. I used and, you, and you have yeah. certainly mastered perspective. Oh, thank you. You have. I mean, to have gone through all that you went through, f- losing five people in six years, and to turn it around in your mind and in your life so that you've actually learn to find joy and happiness and and love on a regular basis that's a phenomenal accomplishment thank you well before we we leave you because i don't really want to end the conversation yet but (laughs) we do have to draw to a close are there any last tidbits you want to leave our audience with before you go oh i just want everybody to be happy Connect with your joy. Find something every day, no matter how down you feel, no matter how maybe depressed or how if or, if you, or challenges that come up for you. Just find something that makes you happy. Whether it's a you know a puppy snuggling in, you know up against your neck or smiling at someone, you know just give out one of yours. You'll get one back. It's all reciprocal, you know, reciprocal. Uh, do one thing that makes you happy. One thing that brings you joy that you know will always make you happy and start there. If, 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 you, if you don't know where to start, start with that and uh, keep it simple. Mm-hmm. It's not supposed to be real complicated. Just keep it simple. And take a day at a time, a moment at a time, and connect with those now moments that are so important that, because they're healing. Mm. The remarkable thing, of course, being that no matter how dark your place might be today, if you just do that one little exercise every single day, things will turn around a lot faster than you might expect. Mm-hmm. They will. Yep. And as you do that every day, it multiplies, mm. and you gain momentum. And that's where the losses start turning into victories. Exactly. Deborah Oakland, thank you so much for joining us on the program today. It's been a pleasure and, and thoroughly enjoyable for me. Well, thank you for having me on, and thank you to Elizabeth Hamilton Garino for introducing us. I, yep. I'm mm-hmm. thrilled, and I saw you had Gary Kobat on, and yeah, oh, that was great. Amazing. He oh. is fun. He is so. He gets it. He does. He is one person who gets it. He lives in the moment. He walks his talk, and I so admire him. Yep. As do me too, me the too. girls. You know, I just it, 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 I love connecting with people like like that it's it's such a blessing in my life and in ours as well so again thank you for joining us on the program we really appreciate it thank you we'll see you all next time here on LOA today goodbye everybody